I should say I live in London. The Open University is in Milton Keynes, so we have to <laughs> give it credit for being in the great city of Milton Keynes. Um, <clears throat> anyway, thank you very much the organization, to the organizers for this invitation to this really stimulating conference. And I will begin and try to keep my remarks to the time limit. Um, <clears throat> Collections of antiquities were essential to the concept of ideal vision, yet surprisingly their role in the formation of artistic ideals is today often taken for granted rather than discussed or analyzed directly. At the same time, framing this discussion is a difficult task since collections of antiquities are such complex and diverse phenomena. There are myriad approaches, myriad considerations, and more than a century of art historical debate dealing with the reception of the antique that could be brought to bear upon this topic. Thus, what I can aim for today is really only to present select points that will offer a framework for further discussion and research. As we're all aware, antiquities collecting in Rome relies on a very long history of reuse that stretches back centuries before the beginning of what we call collecting. Um, by the second half of the 15th century, however, the reception of the antique was centered quite clearly on a relatively new phenomenon. That is, collections of life-sized figural marbles um, in, private, in private houses and palaces. And this has been described as a movement from an earlier phase of a political reuse of the antique towards an aesthetic or artistic one. And the paradigm shift for this has been thought to be a landmark moment when uh, Sixtus IV transferred bronzes from the front of the Lateran, where there had been symbols of political papal authority, to the so-called first museum um, founded on the Capitol Line. And that word museum um, has been echoing through the whole history of the literature. Um, however, work by Salvatore Settis has com complicated this story greatly. And in my own work, I've also tried to build on and complicate this story by considering what we might think of the aestheticization of the antique with particular attention to the role of literati, poets, artistically inclined humanists, who mediated between Rome and intellectual media such as Venice, Padua, and Florence. In the age of the Roman mirabilia, large antique objects often made in very precious materials such as porphyry, granite, or bronze, were regarded with what we could already call a sense of ideal vision. And here I'm showing the bronze piña brought sometime in the 12th century or perhaps earlier um, to the forecourt of St. Peter's for reuse as a fountain. Um, objects in bronze and porphyry, massive ruins and statues with civic, political, or ecclesiastical symbolism over the centuries were regarded as wondrous. Yet these objects began to be supplemented by the 14th and 15th century by other types which were not valued for their size or material splendor as much as for the opposite, their fragility, their breakability, and their vulnerability. Um, what is emphasized by placing antiquities in the framework of the collection is the fact of their survival and their salvation the celebration of their removal from undignified settings or places where they might be exposed to the detrimental effects of time and nature, the recognition of their fragmentation and the need for their restoration and protection from further harm, and the articulation of the ideals of cleanliness, rescue, permanence, accessibility, and visibility to those who would benefit from their sight. In the inscriptions in the Della Valle collection of the 1520s, this audience who should view and see antiquities is defined, for example, as friends, citizens, and strangers, or as poets and painters. The well-known painting here by Hermanus Postumus titled Tempus Adax Rerum, Time the Devourer of, all, Devourer of All Things, articulates in a sense what collecting is supposed to do. We see antique objects strewn in the open landscape where time and the elements are allowed to devour them. At the same time, we see artists busily measuring and sketching ancient figures in order to discover their secrets before their loss. Collections were a remedy to this situation as places that aim to stop or reverse the effects of time and nature and ensure that such artists could continue to access these valuable secrets. And you just see this um, artist here with a, a compass and this one sketching. 
Collecting took shape primarily around objects in white marble by the end of the by the, the lit second half of the 15th century because these objects were relatively easy to find because of their perceived artistic value and also because they were uniquely vulnerable to the Calca traders and thus had become the focus of particular anxieties and discussions about vulnerability and loss. Um, indeed, what we recognize is the first collections emerged during the escalation of protests against idol smashing <coughs> and Calca burning seen first in the Trecento and early Quattrocento, as is known thanks to Tilman Budensieg's investigation of the rise of sentiments in the context of shifting attitudes towards Pope Gregory the Great. Um, Gregory had been praised in the medieval era for getting rid of pagan idolatry, but then a shift occurs which Budensieg traces to Petrarch's circle as Gregory's wanton destruction of ancient books and literary works at first begins to be condemned, and then this condemnation widens to include Gregory's purposeful destruction, not just of ancient texts, but also of statues, ancient statues. And in Rome circa 1400, Petrarch's friend uh, Francesco da Fiano led a group of literati in the Rome, Rome's first humanist circle at the Curia, and his pupil Cencio de Rustici and others in this group loudly lamented the fragility and vulnerability of antiquities, regretting their miserable and irreparable loss of objects that they saw as the work of Phidias and Praxiteles, which were thrown every day into the kilns. This must have been quite a real sight that they saw statues putting, put into the kilns. Uh, this discussion was taken up by Pomponio Leto's academy in the mid-Quattrocento and has become widespread by the second half of that century. The emphasis on the vulnerability of marbles and inscriptions and the urgent need to save them brought together a growing artistic and historical appreciation for ancient sculpture and epigraphy, jointly fostered by artists, humanists, writers, and patrons, which offered them opportunities for rhetorical positioning around the concepts of permanence and memory. Collectors and artists took credit for bringing the arts back to life, not only by uncovering and preserving objects which had been buried for many centuries, but also by helping to restore the supposed theoretical principles of the arts that had been so brilliantly formulated by antique master artists that had been forgotten and now were supposedly in danger of being permanently forgotten if statues were destroyed. So what are the practical and intellectual processes that give shape to this intensive focus on antiquities? The answers to this question are complex, um, and indeed, when we begin to search for an ideal vision of the antique, we find that the antique is not a single idea, but a malleable concept that can be framed in many different ways. And even if there's not time to treat such topics in depth in this context, any more thorough consideration of the topic must grapple with questions of how ideals are constructed, by whom, for what purposes, what roles power, gender, and sexuality play in their formation. In this context, however, I'd like to focus on a few of these summary points. Um, ideal vision in artistic practice and theory, the overlap between antiquities and religious objects, the formation of an, an aesthetic ideal by collecting practices, selection, movement, and framing of objects, and a sense of ideal vision given shape by architects or designers. So to begin with the first, artists were intensely keen to study antique sculpture as part of a growing interest in northern Italian and central Italian traditions for drawing sculpture of all types, not only antique. According to Alberti, while nature was still the artist's best teacher. Sculptures modulated surface could teach how to create with light and shade the illusion of relief necessary for painting solid looking figures. At the same time, ancient sculpture gained a reputation as a form of art that had been perfected by theory. For example, the sorts of canons of proportion known from Vitruvius and Galen, or from what was known of Polycletus's lost treatise on sculpture. Um, with the destruction of ancient marbles, it was lamented, is the potential loss of this theory of art. In the process, a high art value became attributed to antique sculptures that could be separated from their material value. As Alberti wrote, if figures were made by the hands of Phidias or Praxiteles from lead itself, the lowest of metals, they would be valued more highly than silver. The more the innate artistic qualities of ancient objects came to be valued, 
the more these objects were prized not only in their original form but also in copies. And this is an important step in creating a sense that antiquities represent an ideal. Antique sculptures become highly favored models to be sketched, to be remade in, in bronze, in plaster or gesso, or to be represented in print. This famous portrait by Lorenzo Lotto of Andrea Odoni sheds light on not only Odoni's identity as a collector, but also Lotto's artistic identity in working practices, making reference to the sorts of gesso casts or genuine fragments of antiquities that were now, so, now part of so many artists' studios. Um, there were building blocks in such tour de force artistic compositions. However, also looking at, for example, David Kim's recent work on oriental carpets in Lotto's paintings, we can see that those also function in similar terms. There are visual wonders that are favored for close study in artist, studio, artist studios because they were of special rarity, especially skillful manufacturer, manufacturer, or otherwise of intense visual interests. And leading artists in the Renaissance were keen to shape their professional and creativity, creative identity around such objects, reveling in widespread curiosity about them. Um, just to remember, Lotto was a Venetian artist, and in Venice, antiquities were one of many different types of wonders found locally or imported from throughout the world. In Rome, specifically, antiquities remain um, a particular um, genre with a separate status that is part of the city's identity and urban history. Rome had long taken great pride in its status as a source a source of empire, a source of political and religious authority, and in the 15th and 16th century, a source of artistic ideals. Antiquities gave it that authority. It is a very long-standing practice for outsiders to come to Rome to connect to these sources. And the antiquities collections of Rome, exhibiting Roman objects as Roman wonders, became part of this discourse. At one point in time, emperors had come to receive their crowns and their legitim legitimacy. In the 14th century, Petrarch came to Rome to become a poet laureate. But by the 16th century, artists came to Rome for their own sort of ordination into the priesthood of becoming an artist. Um, which brings us to the next theme, and that is the overlap, I'm sorry about that slide, um, the overlap between antiquities and religious objects. An important factor contributing to the aesthetic idealization of antique sculpture is the practice I've just alluded to, whereby artists and other curiosi traveled to Rome um, to look at antiquities, to draw antiquities, and come to some sense of visual understanding of them. And there's clearly a seamless continuation of the city's long history of pilgrimage, the custom of visiting churches to see particular relics, and the custom of coming to Rome to look at mirabilia and then to look at collections and particular objects in collections. Ideal vision developed around antique objects through the practice of visiting simultaneously churches and antiquities and relics and sculptures. Um, by the end of the 15th century, particularly along the thoroughfare of the Via Papalis, I'm showing here all of the collections of antiquities that were known to be in this region of Rome, the Abitato. Um, an audience made up of locals, distinguished visitors to the city, and pilgrims could visit a cluster of semi-private private, semi -private sculpture galleries. Artists and others certainly had access to these, although the rules of entry are not entirely clear. Um, but by the end of the, the 15th century, we see guidebooks appearing, telling people where to go and what to see. It would be interesting to examine in more detail how the visiting of churches and collections might have been intertwined. And here I'm showing a passage from the Italian translation of Piero Valeriano's Hieroglyphica, book tw 27, which is dedicated to the great antiquities collector Giovanni Grimani, describing how sometime before 1523, Valeriano, during the Holy Week, so the week before Easter, was visiting together with humanists, Angelo Colocci, Battista Casali, other distinguished literati, the seven churches of Rome to be absolved of sins. And while writing between these churches, Valeriano relates, they only spoke about antique sculpture. 
Um, so they're, they're, they're not speaking about what they'd seen in the churches, but only the things that they saw in between the churches along the way. And they stop in, in between looking at the, the, the seven churches to visit vigne and collections and have discussions in front of particular statues. Um, when we consider how ideal vision developed around antiquities, we have to remember that the settings and context in which one viewed profane objects paralleled those of religious objects. In collections, statues were set into shrines with frames around them or put on top of bases where they could look like cult images on top of altars. And so this is a dialogue taking place. It seems a familiar idea to us, but we have to try to recapture the strangeness of the fact that in antiquities collections, put on, that antiquities collections put on display a secular form of art that doesn't exist for the sake of a particular civic or ecclesiastical context or narrative, but is instead meant to be a visual experience. Um, this couldn't have been a sudden process that happened overnight. And there were certainly overlaps ongoing between secular and religious viewing and display in this era. Throughout the process, particular types of visual experience were selected and given special status. Life-size figural um, nudes, of course, but also torsos, a type of object that has long been singled out for its particular art value. And here we see um, a viewer looking at a torso um, and here are several examples of torsos that we know were all placed in niches, sort of like little shrines in collections. Um, and this kind of, this complements what David Summers, Leonard Barkin, Gunter Schweikart have written about the genre of the torso. Torsos, like the torso Belvedere, for example, are a type that become the ideal antiquity for artists because of their muscular and athletic form, and because of their anonymity and their flexibility that allowed them to be reused in many different sorts of compositions. So if we look at these torsos in the Frangipani collection, they were in niches, even though they're not drawn, drawn like that. The Cempolini collection, the Sassi collection, um, little kind of almost like religious shrines um, of these works of great artistic value. So one is, um, so um, we should also remember here that many of the first drawings of antique sculpture were made by artists looking at antique sarcophagi that were in churches. And when Gentile da Fabriano and Pisanello observed antiquities in Rome in the 1420s and 30s, they drew objects that were in public, such as the Quirinal horse tamers. But for the rest, they were really focusing on antique sarcophagi and we don't know in every case where these sarcophagi were, but it's almost certain that they were in churches. And we can think of porticos and forecourts in front of particular churches. Um, Santi Cosma e Damiano, for one, Santa Maria Maggiore, seem to have been places where there were large collections of antique sculpture, uh, sarcophagi in front of the churches that eventually seem to have made their way into private collections. And, um, we know, for example, that sarcophagi and inscriptions were moving from these churches. This one, the Rape of Persephone that entered the Gali collection was in um, Senti Cosmi, Cosma e Demiano um, only a couple of decades before it moved to the Gali collection. So how did that happen? We're not quite sure, but it must have been a process repeated in Rome. So um, to move on, the formation of an aesthetic ideal by collecting practices, um, something we've already referred to a bit, but now I want to talk a bit about, um, more about movement. Um, we've seen how, how collecting antiquities as objects of contemplation and study manifests itself in many ways not least through this movement into artistic spaces, which detaches them from urban contexts or religious settings, or from the setting of the ruins, to be put in these aesthetic contexts in private realms, where the collector is, taken, um, is given responsibility to show them and make them visible uh, in settings that are proper to that experience of vision, dignified settings that are accessible and 
they are open to an appropriate audience who, can, who is expected to benefit from that vision. So <clears throat> there must have been many different routes. We've just talked about sarcophagi, but what are other routes that these antiquities took? Um, to take another example here, we see this relief of a battle between Romans and Gauls. And as Pierluigi Tucci's research on the house of Lorenzo Manlio has shown, the object was originally immured on an arch in Piazza Giudea, this, uh, sorry if I can, this arch here next to the house of Manlio. Um, by the early 16th century, it was extracted from that arch and brought to the collection of Giovanni Ciampolini near Campo dei Fiori. Then, in 1530, it was sold to the artist Giulio Romano. Then, Giulio Romano exported it in 1524 from Rome to Mantova to become part of the ducal collection. So this is a very interesting journey, representative of the sorts of moves that antiquities took from urban ruin to a collection where they're aestheticized to the collection of an artist uh, where, who, as objects of ideal artistic appreciation, then to the collection of a, in, into a princely museum, basically, where the prince is given responsibility for safeguarding this aesthetic object. So a sense of ideal vision is also given by the fact that arch architects and designers are taking an increasing role in, in collections, which is the next point I wanted to make. Um, at the, at the same time that sculptures are moving from these cluttered urban contexts into aesthetic collections, they're not only enshrined by frames, they're also more and more seamless seamlessly incorporated into the plans of architects and designers for grand palaces, gardens, and urban spaces. And I think we can see this as part of the rise of the architect who wants to incorporate sculptures into a grand design. Um, so, some of the most innovative and prestigious architectural projects of the early modern era took antiquities as their part of, point of departure. Bramante's Belvedere, Michelangelo's Campidoglio, um, the Villa Madama. In these settings, statues were meant to be part of the unified whole of the architect's vision. Architects integrated sculptures seamlessly within their designs in symmetrical and well-ordered programs in visually choreographed settings where grander statues were preferred to match the scale and design of grand architecture, where statues were preferably restored or whole rather than fragmented to create a sense of complete visual unity. The trend arguably brought antiquities further into the noble realm of the ideal by making them inseparable and integral parts of this unified scenographic space. So there's nothing casual or accidental about their appearance. Instead, they're part of a perfected and, in all senses, symmetrical design. And I was just, I inserted this slide because of something Sabina Frommel said, which was very interesting in the introduction about distances and that people must have thought a great deal about where people were standing when they were viewing sculpture and just to show that this is, um, there is a theoretical discussion about this, where to stand so that you can see a, in particular very big statues and it has to do with theories of optics and how far optic rays could penetrate. So this is a, it's an important discussion that doesn't seem to get a lot of attention. So just to um, conclude with a few further questions that, I, that we might discuss, um, there's still many questions to be answered and explored in the topic of antiquities and ideal visions, ideal vision, such as what did artists see and value when they looked at antique sculpture? Um, one, about, one of the tropes about encounters with antiquities that one finds in texts and images is that of the artist who carefully measures sculpture. Vasari, for example, often writes that one artist or another went to Rome to measure antiquities. And you see that the, the compass becomes a kind of a trope uh, for how people are interacting with sculpture. Um, it's, you can see this in the, in the Tempus Adex Rerum that we saw, and we see this in portraits, one that Ulrich Fisterer referred to uh, also in the introduction, oops, and another um, in Munich. So 
Um, it's, it's interesting to, to question whether this is a trope or if this is something real that, uh, that artists were measuring antique sculptures. Um, one thinks that it might possibly be a trope taken from, taken from um, architectural practices because there are so few measured drawings of antique sculpture. Um, artists just weren't interested in, in writing down measurements of, of sculpture, it seems, unless there are lots of these that just don't survive. The only surviving um, drawing which shows measurements of an antique sculpture is this one by Raphael with measurements by his assistant Giovanni da Udine of one of the Quirinal horse tamers. So this is, a, this is a question. What were artists doing when they were in sculpture collections or in front of antiquities? Um, this direct face-to-face -face encounter between artists and antiquities is increasingly, however, referenced. And that's something that's, that's interesting. I think that, um, that artists are interested in showing themselves in these settings uh, and people are interested in seeing artists in these settings. So more and more, uh, the general public is interested in the technique of drawing and the, uh, the processes of drawing and in the fact that artists have made this trip. It becomes a kind of um, vision in itself that people are interested in seeing. So we have Martin van Heemskerk's self-portrait in Cambridge that shows him with his pen and ink in front of the Colosseum um, and these two drawings by Van Heemskerk show figures inside collections. These are drawings of the Medici collection at Palazzo Madama, which show encounters between modern figures and, and um, works of art. And I've long wondered what this figure is doing with his hands here. He's not drawing, but he might be making a model in wax, or um, it's, it's not clear. Uh, when we look at these images, we can't take them at face value, and we just have to remember that they're created for, with very specific interests in mind. Uh, Roman collectors who hosted these drawers would have wanted their, their collections to be seen in a positive light as places that are used, enjoyed, and valued. Um, and Heemskerk himself wanted to advertise his own expert knowledge and intense engagement with these places where he absorbed all of these supposed lessons. Um, so just to show another couple of images which seem to illustrate this trend I'm talking about, being seen in the collection as an intense laborer, an intense studier, is something that becomes of more interest, not only for artists, but also for their patrons and for the general public at large. So, they play upon what was, by Van Heemskerk and Bandinelli's day, a very widespread faith in the ideal vision of the antique, bound up with the supposed virtue of tireless study of the antique in Rome, this competitive, insatiable study of the greatest masterpieces of art. Uh, Baccio Bandinelli's favorite print, famous print of the Academia in the Belvedere, where they're studying sculpture not only by day, but also by night, by candlelight. And Frederico, Frederico Zucchero's cycle of drawings commemorating his brother Tadeo's diligence in absorbing these lessons of the antique, this kind of hyper-exaggerated idealization of the antique, uh, which is a phenomenon, I think, that also merits more explanation, exploration. So thank you very much. <laughs>